How are, how is everybody doing tonight? Good. Good. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's an opportunity for me to be here. Um, I first just want to say that um, I thank Brooks Rehab for inviting me. Um, this is not something I do much of, but I enjoy every opportunity that is like this. So hopefully um, we can all gain something from tonight's talk. Um, that's really the whole point. And um, I'm going to try to talk about Parkinson's disease and uh, the diagnosis and treatment options that are available currently. Um, but maybe talk a little bit more on a broader scope um, in terms of what we know about neurology and what, um, what we know about rehab and how the two can work together in order to improve uh, quality of life mainly, but also functioning. I'm Dr. Kai McGreevy and um, I am a board certified neurologist. I am the medical director at McGreevy NeuroHealth. We're located in Inter International Golf Parkway in World Golf Village. Um, and so we'll go ahead and get started. So I'd like to start off with a quote. Um, here and, and it says education is what remains after one has forgotten that what one has learned in school. And it, this kind of hit home to me because um, I've spent many years in medical school and residency and fellowship and training uh, just to have the opportunity to start to evaluate and treat patients. Um, and so I've learned about Parkinson's disease for maybe 20 years now essentially but it's always a great opportunity to review some of these things. So this talk is really um, beneficial to me as well. So some of the main points of the talk um, include the following. Um, first, the diagnosis and treatment of Parkinson's disease should start with your neurologist. So neurologists are designed to understand the nuances of how Parkinson's disease presents with patients. Um, and in our training, there are other um, medical doctors that are capable of uh, perhaps uh, seeing patients with Parkinson's, but to really understand the nuances of the neurological exam and to be able to tease out the symptoms and signs which this, this particular disease relies on, it really comes down to having a board certified neurologist to take hold. Um, the second point here is that uh, Parkinson's disease is primarily a clinical diagnosis and that's important. Um, essentially we are of the opinion still that we do not have biomarkers for example in the blood or even on imaging um, or in the cerebrospinal fluid to be able to say, aha, this is 100% Parkinson's disease. And that particular disease is not alone. The same goes for a lot of the neurodegenerative disorders. And in fact, the only definitive diagnosis that can be made with these types of disorders is what is post-mortem. Um, and when we examine uh, the brain after, um, and that's the only way to definitively know whether Parkinson's disease is present. That being said, there's a lot of research that is constantly happening to really try to find those markers for early detection and then hopefully as we understand the physiological process of Parkinson's, then the right type of cure type treatments can come, become available. The other um, main point I'd like to make is that it's really important to recognize and treat both the motor symptoms and non-motor symptoms that are associated with Parkinson's. And I'll get into that a little bit deeper later. Um, as with any uh, form of neurological disease, I think it's very important to use a multidisciplinary approach. The neurologist alone can do only so much. Uh, the uh, physical medicine and rehabilitation can only do so much, but when we work together, we're more likely to be able to improve functioning and quality of life. So this is very important. I, I think I would speak to 
those who have Parkinson's disease or maybe have symptoms of Parkinsonism, family members that may be here, I think is really important to keep that in mind that you want to engender as much help as possible for this. This is not something that one single specialist can really handle. Um, this is something that requires um, perhaps a neurologist who can drive the management, but that neurologist needs extra help as well. As I go through the talk, I'd also like to point out that classically in neurology over 30, 40 years, we've, it's, there's been kind of a dogma that the brain is a static organ. In other words, um, whatever happens to the brain is permanent and can't be changed. And this dogma has even persisted through my training as a medical student, resident, and fellow. Um, but since then, we've um, had rapid advancements in understanding that the brain can change. And I'll allude to that a little bit later in the talk. Um, and finally, presently there is unfortunately not a cure for Parkinson's disease. However, it should be noted there are ways to slow the decline in functioning and also to prevent injury and improve the quality of life. So first, we kind of want to get a, maybe a picture of, of Parkinson's disease and who might be affected. Um, we know that about a million Americans currently are living with Parkinson's. About 60,000 Americans are diagnosed with Parkinson's every year and that is probably underdiagnosed. An estimated 96% of patients will present after the age of 50, but there are earlier onset forms of Parkinson's. You may have heard of Michael J. Fox as an example. He um, was diagnosed with Parkinson's at the age of 26, 27. Men are 1.5 times more likely than women to be afflicted with <coughs> Parkinson's disease. Some familiar faces, perhaps, um, Muhammad Ali, the Pope, and Michael J. Fox, as we said earlier. Um, these are all uh, examples of, of folks who've had the disease. So we should probably ask ourselves then, well, what is Parkinson's exactly? And there are different components to the diagnosis. So we can say that it's a slowly progressive neurodegenerative disease or process, um, the, there is a depletion or reduction in the brain chemical that is naturally produced by the brain called dopamine. Uh, Parkinson's disease affects the control of movement, okay, so the key word here is actually control. Um, many problems in the neurological system can produce uh, movement problems or difficulty moving. So for example, we can have muscular conditions uh, that are not um, neurological in origin that can lead to weakness and atrophy and present with difficulty with movement. That is not what we're discussing tonight. Another example would be peripheral neuropathy, and, uh, where the nerves themselves out in the periphery are diseased by some process but that is not what we're discussing tonight. We're talking about a movement disorder that originates in a specific part of the brain. The hallmark symptoms are as follows. So we see slowed movements, muscle rigidity, tremor, and instability. And we'll kind of come back around and, and see that in a moment. And finally, it's important to recognize that, as I said, uh, Parkinson's disease is not just a movement disorder. Um, in reality, it carries with it some non-motor symptoms, and those are symptoms that the neurologist should pay attention to. These are symptoms that uh, are easily neglected, if you will, um, unless the right um, type of physician is taking care of you. So we talked about those hallmark symptoms, and I'll get a little bit into it. Um, the first one's called bradykinesia, and bradykinesia, this basically is a, a complicated word. Brady meaning slowed, and kinesia meaning movement, so slowed movements. 
um, everything is slowed down. And interestingly, with the control of movement problem, um, we're not necessarily just talking about movement of the limbs. We are also talking about movements, for example, of the muscles that produce speech or vo uh, volume of speech. And, um, and so the manifestation of Parkinson's is much more than just weakness in the limbs. An example would be small handwriting, and we'll see this in a, in a moment. But one of the characteristic features of um, bradykinesia and Parkinson's is a very slow, deliberate um, handwriting that the patient notices. And, in, and sometimes it can occur only on one side, especially early in the disease process, um, and versus the other side. And we'll get into that in a minute. Another one is reduced facial expression. So the muscles that move the face, in fact, can slow down, just like the muscles in the limbs. As we said before, the amplitude of the voice is very subdued. It's uh, what we say is monotonous. There's not much inflection in the speech itself. It's very monotone and hypophonic, meaning very low amplitude, very quiet. And that is important to point out because that is a, can be or, uh, perceived as a communication barrier sometimes. And it's really important that we understand that rehabilitation involves being able to increase that amplitude. And our um, Brooks Rehab folks will talk about that a little bit later tonight. Reduced blink rate. So that's probably something that maybe not many would understand, but the muscles that control eye blinking are also slowed down. So you can kind of already get a sense that the main motor circuit in the brain is affected here. And this results in kind of a staring expression, okay? And this, these symptoms don't always occur in every single patient who has Parkinson's, but some of these are the hallmark features that really we see in this disorder and not in any other neurological disorder. Slowness rising from a chair or turning in bed, those are some pretty uh, common symptoms and definitely uh, slowed movement in terms of gait. So walking becomes much more uh, slowed down and deliberate. The next hallmark symptom is tremor, and this is the one that becomes more obvious and that we associate with Parkinson's probably more commonly. Um, the type of tremor is important, and again, clinically, from a neurologist, we can usually pick out what type of tremor that we're seeing, okay? We see lots of different tremor out there, and Parkinson's is only one form. Um, but one of the defining features is that the tremor occurs at rest. So in other words, sometimes um, patients will have a, a develop a tremor and that tremor will be on one side, particularly early in the course of the illness. But as soon as they try to do something with their cup of coffee or water, the tremor extinguishes, it goes away. And in other words, it's not an action tremor, it's more a tremor at rest. For neurologists, we pay attention to how fast that tremor is, or how the frequency. So we think of the tremor in oscillations. In other words, it kind of comes up and down, up and down, up and down. And so the rate at which that occurs gives us an idea of what type of tremor we're dealing with. To give an example, um, there are other tremors known as essential tremor, you may have heard, or benign essential tremor, that presents very differently than the tremor with Parkinson's. In, in fact, the uh, frequency is much different, but most importantly, there's more of an action tremor uh, component. One of the items that I should point out and allude to is that tremor is somewhat easier to see for folks and that um, in some cases that where tremor does not respond to medication therapy, then they may be amenable to something called deep brain stimulation or DBS. Okay, so the third um, 
hallmark sign is postural instability. What does that mean? So what we're really talking about here is that we're talking about posture. And particularly, we see folks with, that take on a kind of a stooped posture. Um, and as they walk, it's a, they have a reduced arm swing, almost no arm swing at all. And they're kind of stooped. Um, the gait, you'll hear more of a shuffle. And it's more deliberate. Um, versus somebody who is, does not have Parkinson's, you can he almost hear them walking down the hall. Um, and you don't hear the shuffling, but you can hear it and see it um, in somebody who has the disease. Um, the gait can be such that um, the movements of shuffling try to catch up with the center of gravity of the body. So with the stooped posture, the tendency to lean forward is placing the center of gravity forward. and the, feet are trying to catch up, essentially. And um, so sometimes it, the type of gait that we can see with Parkinson's is a festination, trying to catch up with the center of gravity. These problems present a risk for falls, and that's a really important uh, feature here. So the importance of the right medications, the right dosing of medication, the right rehabilitation. Um, those factors are very important for preventing falls. Last one, rigidity. So this is a um, really important feature. The rigidity is what can ultimately lead to something called freezing. And that can be very scary for patients and it can be scary for uh, loved ones as well. And it's important to understand what that process is. Um, the stiffness itself can present on one side first, initially early in the course of the disease, but it can progress to involve both sides. The neurologist, when they examine the patient, uh, will check something called tone. And that tone is really what gives us an idea of how rigid the patient's uh, arms are or how rigid the legs are. <coughs> Some patients may describe something called lead pipe rigidity. That's what it sometimes feels like. And neurologists will notice uh, what we call a ratchety quality. So when I check for tone on somebody with Parkinson's, I can feel not a smooth range of motion about the elbow, but more of a, a ratchet. And that phenomenon, again, is very classic for Parkinson's and no other disease, essentially. And lastly, if we're having freezing, this is something that uh, imp implicates something called off time. And I'll get into that as it relates to medications when they're working and then when they're not working anymore. So just an artist's rendition of some of the features that I described earlier. Um, and there are different uh, flavors of this, of this particular condition. Um, but essentially, we see kind of that reduced facial expression, the reduced blink rate, and the, what we call the Parkinsonian kind of stare. Um, sometimes uh, we will see or hear the quiet, monotonous speech, the lead pipe rigidity, and that cogwheeling or ratchety quality, uh, the rest tremor and postural instability and risk for falls. This is an example here of hand, the handwriting and micrographia is what we call it, where the, you have the spiral uh, drawn by a normal individual, but then you can see in other types of tremor that the uh, amplitude of the tremor and the, um, how erratic the tremor may be is it varies depending on the pathology or what the problem is. In Parkinson's, as I said before, it's a rest tremor. So when, they intend, when we intend to draw or write, there's no problem in terms of control in, in that way. You can see uh, with Parkinson's here that 
really the uh, concentric circles are not touching each other. That's pretty fine motor control right there, but it's, it's just very small. And the same goes over here. This is just another example on the bottom. Um, somebody who, in the same patient who has Parkinson's disease on the right side versus the left side. So they're afflicted more with the micrographia on one side. Probably not as important for patients uh, to understand this, but it is important for neurologists to detect it. And this is, these are some of the ways that we look for where the problem is. Very few neurological conditions cause something like this. All right, so some folks in the audience may be wondering, well, what causes Parkinson's? Uh, we understand there's not a cure, but can we understand what it is? Um, and so in this particular slide, I'll try to ex explain it a little bit. Um, so on the left, you have um, somebody with a healthy brain. And on the right, this is a brain that has um, Parkinson's disease pathology. And so there's an area of the brain that's called the substantia nigra. Nigra meaning uh, black. And so you'll see this pigmented area here that contains neurons or brain cells. And these brain cells are thought to take part in the motor circuit, and particularly the, um, the control of movement. And we'll see that um, the, in comparison to the healthy patient, the patient with Parkinson's disease has a drop or a loss of those neurons. The, the cells are lost and the pigment is gone. And so this just signifies that we understand where the pathology lies. This particular part of the brain is deep inside the brain, so it's not necessarily easy to access, if you will. Um, and we'll get into that and, and, and explain that a little bit later as well. When we take the Parkinson's, um, or I should say the healthy patient, uh, and we look at the brain under the microscope, we see a nice volume of neurons, and these are all stained so that you can see the brown, uh, which, which is inside the cells, called the cytoplasm, and we see lots of neuronal volume here, which is what is normal. Next to it, in this slide, we see a lot of cell dropout, essentially, and this is what we are uh, witnessing with uh, Parkinson's disease. Within those cells, there's, we, there's an abnormality. And that abnormality is something called a Lewy body. And that Lewy body inclusion is pathognomonic, or in other words, aha, this is Parkinson's disease. Unfortunately, because of the area of the brain, um, we really don't have a way of biopsying or getting that sense of uh, that aha moment yet. So the bottom line is when we have cell dropout over time, slowly, this is a slow process, um, we're, getting, we're having a reduction in a neurotransmitter called dopamine. So dopamine, we wonder what, what does dopamine do? What's the purpose of that neurotransmitter? So we already said the origin of its production is in that dark pigmented region of the brain called the substantia nigra. What we also understand is this neurotransmitter has a wide-ranging impact, and in fact, it affects multiple regions other than the substantia nigra. So there are projections from the substantia nigra to other brain centers that are involved in the control of movement, but also involved in thinking, in cognition, involved in memory, involved in personality, and so when we have a dropout of dopamine, we can expect to see both motor problems, but also other issues like cognitive problems, as well as executive dysfunction, which I'll get into, and some personality or behavioral changes that we can sometimes see with Parkinson's. And to kind of complicate matters, the dopamine um, balance in the brain, if you will, affects 
other neurotransmitters such as serotonin, which is involved in mood regulation, and hence some patients may develop anxiety or depression, and acetylcholine, which is another neurotransmitter that really affects memory and cognition and alertness. So fluctuations that may be seen in the dopamine circuit also will affect the fluctuations that we see in these other circuits as well. So it's kind of a scale, if you will. Um, you know, we're trying to balance the dopamine with the other neurotransmitters. And when one is off uh, balance, then the others might be off as well. So we've kind of discussed a little bit about the motor side, uh, the mo movement disorder, the, the part of Parkinson's that we are used to seeing perhaps, but these non-motor symptoms are really important. So for caregivers and patients, it's important to recognize things like depression. It's actually a high percentage of folks with Parkinson's that, ha that will develop some level of depressive disorder or sadness. Um, and we may not know, understand exactly why that happens, but we do know that those acetylcholine and serotonin levels are fluctuating. And so that will have an effect on the mind. Sleep disorders. So that can be sleep fragmentation. So in other words, difficulty initiating sleep, difficulty maintaining sleep, uh, folks will have potentially sleep attacks that occur during the day. So there are a lot of um, problems that can occur here that should be addressed or at least identified by your neurologist. Autonomic disorders and orthostatic hypotension. This is really important. Um, Parkinson's disease is more than just movement. Um, and unfortunately, it can affect the way the brain controls heart rate and how it can control blood pressure. And so one can be at higher risk of having a drop in blood pressure, uh, particularly when rising from sit to stand and develop um, the lightheadedness and feeling like you're about to pass out. Um, that's called presyncope. That's going to lead to fall risk on top of the movement problem. Incontinence, constipation, these are all tied in with autonomic change. Memory loss as we described. Dementia. Dementia is present in about 25 to 30 pa percent of patients with Parkinson's, but I'll get into what that means in a little bit. And finally, another non-motor symptom is hallucinations. And this is really important for patients and caregivers to understand that that's a part of this process. It does not mean that there is another disorder compounding on top of Parkinson's. It's all part of the same, same picture, and it is related to dopamine changes. So as I alluded to before, very high incidence of cognitive change, um, basically involving the ability to think and the, um, you should know that it's often manageable with just adjustments in daily routine. In dementia, if this it were to occur, we're really talking about something completely different than Alzheimer's disease. And when we think of dementia, most of us think, oh, that means Alzheimer's and this is a very bad prognosis. And it should be pointed out here that the type of memory problem or cognitive problem is better managed than with Alzheimer's disease. Um, first, the progression of the memory loss and cognition is very different. It's much slower. And the impact on memory itself is different. And what that means is, is that patients with Parkinson's will um, have some difficulty with attention and concentration, which is that first layer of, that first uh, step in order to retrieve information and bring it into the brain to store it as a memory. In Parkinson's, that attention and concentration is 
uh, mostly the problem. But once we can get that attention and concentration and, and tricks to, to be able to improve that superficial problem, then most of the time the memory itself can encode. Uh, versus in Alzheimer's disease, it's that final step that is the problem. And even if there's attentional problems with Alzheimer's disease, it's very difficult to um, form those new memories and, and, and keep them. So these impairments uh, may obviously um, interfere with daily functioning um, and language and uh, being able to comprehend and then um, uh, to be able to come out with uh, the motor component of speech is affected by this condition as well. So it does lead to problems with communication. And as I said before, um, attention and working memory is affected and, and patients with Parkinson's, again different than Alzheimer's disease, will be clear as a bell one at one point in time and then within the same day or week you may find them to be very cloudy, kind of foggy. And um, this is a, a clear distinction in the, the type of memory disorder that we see with Parkinson's versus AD. Um, so, and this correlates with the, the fluctuation in the chemicals in the brain, essentially the acetylcholine. Um, some patients may be having difficulty holding their thoughts in line, um, keeping a train of thought, uh, may zone out in the middle of a conversation and then try to return to it and forget where they were within the conversation. But this is much different than the memory disorder of Alzheimer's. And in fact, this is most of the time some, somehow related to attentional or concentration difficulties. Executive dysfunction occurs with uh, the cognitive problems with Parkinson's and this includes things like problem solving, um, planning or organizing your day, um, making decisions, um, word retrieval and cognitive flexibility. So um, sometimes it's difficult to get away or shift gears from one topic to another topic and this is called executive dysfunction. It's seen with other types of memory conditions as well, not just with Parkinson's, but this is one of the potential features that we see. Um, motivation and initiation. This is a big um, cognitive problem with Parkinson's because if there's one theme I'd like you to try to get out of the talk today, it really has to do with the brain um, craving, if you will, activity and stimulation. And the, one of the problems is that there's um, a, a lack of motivation in, in, due to the brain disorder itself. And so it's important for caregivers to understand that if a patient is not engaging too much into their rehabilitation or maybe not coming forth with the symptoms that they're <coughs> describing, it may be A, the disease process itself, but also to help that individual and, and to try to engage them into something, uh, engage them into exercise programs, rehabilitation, and the more you stimulate the brain, the more it is forced to change. So the treatments for Parkinson's are, should be tailored, um, and I'm gonna describe just some basics of the medications some of you may have already heard of levodopa carbidopa. That's our first line therapy, but it's not the only first line therapy for Parkinson's disease. Um, we use this because levodopa essentially behaves like dopamine that you already were producing in the good neurons. Um, there are different formulations and there are different reasons for using levodopa and replenishing the dopamine in the substantia nigra and the motor circuit. Um, some of these include dissolvable forms, for instance. So le uh, levodopa can produce some nausea. Um, and it doesn't happen with every patient, but when it does, there are other forms of the medication that can be a little less in, um, of a problem with the gut.
Another first line therapy is in the category of what we call dopamine agonists. In other words, medications that are synthesized to act like dopamine. And you may have heard of some of those, Mirapex and Requip. Those are pretty common. These are also used for something called restless leg syndrome. Um, but these medicines are essentially all trying to upregulate the dopamine in the brain because it's lacking. Some other formulations include um, something called COMT inhibitors. This is basically there are enzymes uh, or um, um, proteins that are inside the brain that are designed to break down dopamine and um, we want to inhibit that. We want to preserve as much dopamine as we can, right? So that's what the, the purpose of this type of medicine is. And some of those you may have heard of. Stilevo is a uh, medicine that combines um, the dopamine or the levodopa along with entacapone. Amantadine is um, often used as an adjunct. So in other words, um, one may be on levodopa to replenish the dopamine, but sometimes the dopamine levels are um, producing other unwanted symptoms and in fact excessive movements. So you may have seen Michael J. Fox on TV and it seems like that his movements are not slowed by any stretch. In fact, it's the opposite, the other way around. That's the medication. It's not the disease necessarily. It's really the medication where that, the dopamine levels are actually increased and there's excessive movements and we call that dyskinesias. So amantadine can be added to the levodopa to kind of balance that out so you can manage the symptoms of those excessive movements. Anticholinergic medications, this is important to point out because um, as I said before, dopamine's affected but so are the other chemicals. So this helps to balance out the acetylcholine issue in Parkinson's and uh, medications. So this is an example. Medications do work and they don't work necessarily for the duration of time that you would necessarily like it, in which case um, the, this kind of presents why this happens. We'll see that somebody with on symptoms, in other words, they'll have normal volume of handwriting compared to somebody with off symptoms. In other words, the medicine is off or not working or uh, the levels of the medication are not where they need to be. And in those instances, you see the micrographia here. Just another rendition, of the same concept here we see fluctuations. And these uh, fluctuations not only occur with tremor, but they can occur with the motor symptoms as a whole. So the rigidity becomes worse, the uh, slowed movements, the tremor, and the instability all can be affected by off time. And we call that wearing off. And so your neurologist is going to be paying attention to the way the medication is dosed and how frequent and with the goal of reducing the off time. As I alluded to before, dopamine, when it's deficient, it leads to Parkinsonism. When dopamine is, there's a surplus, it can lead to other problems like excessive movements and in fact it can lead to hallucinations as well. And so the disease process itself can present with hallucinations, and these are usually visual, not auditory. They're usually visual hallucinations, seeing something that's not there. And it tends to occur usually in the later courses of the, the disease, like stage five. Um, but the medications sometimes, if they produce, if there's enough dopamine, it can lead to hallucinations as well. So it's again important for your neurologist, for the caregiver to understand that if this were to occur earlier in the stage of the disease, it's most likely the medication. So I'd like to just point out here that um, yes, there are side effects with medications. And that's why it's important for your physician to keep tabs and for the patient and the caregiver to report every side effect. Just bring them.
um, because the patient or caregiver may not know what is relevant and what's not, but the neurologist should know. Um, but I think one of the breakdowns in our current system is communication. Um, and this is something that has nothing to do with meds and it doesn't have anything to do with the disease. It has everything to do with the interaction between the physician and the patient. And so somebody who has Parkinson's really needs to have a thorough workup and a thorough examination. Um, and really understand not only the motor symptoms but also the non-motor symptoms that we've described because all of it is relevant. So that segues into the notion that okay well that means that we need to provide complete care. Well we should be doing that anyway but I know for certain that that really doesn't always happen and so as the patient or the caregiver you have to take the bull by the horns so to speak and you have to kind of keep asking, keep, keep questioning. Uh, not necessarily the diagnosis, but what are, the, what are these symptoms? Are these symptoms somehow related to the Parkinson's or not? And can we manage those symptoms or can we, can we fix them? A lot of times the memory problems, the constipation, the um, issues with executive function, these are things that are actually manageable. Okay, so that kind of brings me to the final phase of the talk today, and this is about uh, something called deep brain stimulation. So deep brain stimulation has actually been around for quite some time now, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, play a video and stop talking. We started out the talk and it seemed like it was kind of doom and gloom, but uh, the reality is that uh, through the course of Parkinson's, there are, it, it's a, there's, there's a lot that, that happens. And um, it's important for us to be prepared for that as caregivers as well as patients. Um, but your um, team is just as important in, in this whole process to help guide. Um, and the team really should start with your primary care physician. Um, even if the diagnosis is made by the neurologist, um, a lot of the non-motor symptoms can be managed by primary care and should always be, um, you should always be coming back to them. Um, obviously the neurologist and, and preferably somebody who's adept with movement disorders um, would be your go-to help with uh, psychologists, neuropsychologists, to help with problems with depression, anxiety, um, just as important about quality of life. Neurosurgery comes into play with deep brain stimulation. We have very good neurosurgeons in the Northeast Florida region, particularly uh, with movement disorders, um, spe uh, specialization to, to be able to implant a deep brain stimulator. Physical medicine and rehabilitation, huge. Um, meds will only do so much sometimes, uh, but it's the functionality that's the key, and it's also the fall risk reduction that's the key uh, to prevent further injury. And, you know, Parkinson's isn't necessarily just the disease itself, but can lead to other potential injury and harm. Memory care, also very important. Um, stimulation of the brain, as I said before, can only help. And finally, counseling. So from here, I'll leave it finally to the uh, Brooks Rehab here, and, and I think they're going to go forward and talk a little bit about some of those rehabilitation measures that can be done uh, to really help boost some of the symptoms, to improve the amplitude of the movements, improve the amplitude of the voice, and uh, ultimately to improve quality of life.